Watch this. What just happened? The answer to that question explains how water turns to vapor, how opinions spread on social media, how neurons fire in the brain, how to make the best cup of coffee, and why fluids do this. What's the connection between all of these things? First things first, what just happened here? This is a piece of steel that contains iron. Iron behaves as a temporary magnet at room temperatures. What makes it magnetic is the orientation of its individual atoms. Each atom has its own magnetization, which we call a dipole. In the presence of a magnetic field, the dipoles align with the magnetic field, making the iron magnetic. The magnetization of the entire piece of steel is the combined average magnetization of all of its atomic dipoles. But something interesting happens when we heat it up. At a threshold temperature called the Curie temperature, it suddenly loses its magnetization, or in physics talk, it undergoes a sudden transition from a magnetic phase to a non-magnetic phase. If we plot how the magnetization behaves when temperature increases, we get a graph that looks like this. You can see this sudden drop-off of magnetization. This is called a phase transition. What characterizes a phase transition is a sudden dramatic change in the state of something, like from a liquid to a gas, laminar flow to turbulent flow, and in this case, a magnet going from a magnetic state to a non-magnetic state. This is a bit weird when you think about it. Most physical phenomena go through a gradual change. Why this sudden transition? And why should a magnet lose its magnetization at all? In 1920, the physicist Wilhelm Lenz wondered about the mystery of magnetization as well. To avoid dealing with the messiness and complexity of all the atoms in a magnet, he developed a simplified model, now called the Ising model. He hoped that by studying the simplified model, he could understand the behavior of a real magnet. He imagined a magnet as a grid of dipoles. Each dipole could point either up or down. Just like in a real magnet, if the majority of dipoles are pointing up, the magnetization of the whole system is up. And if the majority of dipoles are pointing down, the magnetization of the whole system is down. Each dipole produces its own local magnetic field, which can influence its neighbors. Neighboring aligned dipoles have lower energy, whereas neighboring anti-aligned dipoles have higher energy. The total energy of the system is determined by the total alignments of all the dipoles. But why do we care about the system's energy? Well, let's get back to a basic principle in physics. In many physical systems, objects want to go from high energy to low energy. Think of a ball falling from some height to the ground. The ball has a lot of potential energy when it's up high, but it naturally wants to move to a more stable, lower energy state. Similarly, in physics, systems tend to rearrange themselves to minimize their energy. The same goes here. The configurations we'll most likely see are the ones that have the lowest energies. In other words, the lowest energy states are the most probable. We can say that the system wants to minimize its energy. At absolute zero, the most probable states are the all up and all down configurations. But what happens when we increase temperature? Well, there's another physical rule at play, the second law of thermodynamics. Systems in nature tend to move toward more disorder over time, or in physics talk, they maximize their entropy. Just think about how perfume molecules spread out over the whole room, mixing with the air molecules. They don't just stay neatly ordered in one corner. 
or how milk molecules naturally mix with the tea molecules. In the same way, the system of dipoles wants to maximize its entropy. So we have two opposing forces, a tug of war between energy minimization and entropy maximization. At low temperatures, energy minimization dominates and most of the dipoles are aligned with each other. There isn't enough thermal energy to jiggle the dipoles. The whole system has a net direction, so magnetization is observed. But when we increase the temperature, it gets so hot that the interaction energies between dipoles are minuscule compared to the amount of thermal energy. The dipoles fluctuate wildly, causing their directions to cancel out and the system loses its magnetization. So far, the Ising model is doing a great job of modeling a real life magnet. At low temperatures, it's magnetic and at high temperatures, it loses its magnetization. So does it predict this abrupt phase transition as well? It turns out the answer is yes. This is a simulation of the Ising model at different temperatures. You can see that around this temperature, the system changes very abruptly. I'll play that again so you can see it again. Right here. Why? You can probably guess that this is the Curie temperature, otherwise known as the critical temperature. And something very interesting happens right at the critical temperature. What's interesting is that it has to do with the local neighboring interactions between dipoles. Why this is interesting is because counterintuitively, these interactions on the microscopic scale are what lead to the dramatic transformations on the macroscopic scale. Let's dig in. Remember how dipoles can influence their neighbors to align? Well, those neighboring dipoles also influence their neighbors to align and so on and so forth. So even though only local interactions are explicitly built into the Ising model, dipoles can influence other dipoles some distance away from them. The ability for one dipole to influence another dipole some distance away is mathematically captured by the correlation length. Correlation length can be thought of as the average distance over which dipoles influence each other. It measures how far fluctuations in the system propagate. Now the thing is, the correlation length between dipoles depends on the temperature of the system. When the temperature is very low, dipoles are somewhat correlated, otherwise we wouldn't see ordering. But dipole flipping doesn't happen easily as there isn't much thermal energy. Interactions between dipoles are essentially kept local. At very high temperatures, the dipoles are flipping around like crazy, so one dipole has very little influence over another dipole. The correlation length is very small. But at the critical temperature, there's a sweet spot where the tendency for the dipoles to align is perfectly balanced against their ability to flip. They're vulnerable to flipping because of the good amount of thermal energy, but the dipole interactions are still strong enough to keep neighboring dipoles aligned if they do flip. This balance is what leads to large scale fluctuations and the sudden phase transition. A single dipole flip can affect a huge portion of the lattice, making the system behave like a single correlated blob. The critical temperature is the tipping point between two phases, where the correlation length peaks at a mathematical infinity. This is how local interactions between microscopic dipoles can manifest as dramatic changes on the macroscopic scale. Even though it's a simple model made up of a grid of arrows, the Ising model gives amazing insight into the complex phase transition that happens in magnets. What's more to know? It turns out, a lot. The Ising model has since gained the nickname the fruit fly of statistical physics because it's been found to describe so many different systems, particularly systems with interacting parts. For example, the Ising model is now used to study gene networks. When a cell wants to do something like enhance or inhibit the production of a certain protein, genes must turn on or off. These states correspond to the up or down dipole states of the Ising model, allowing researchers to study how genes interact with each other and explain complex biological behavior. Another area the Ising model has proved fruitful is in neuroscience. Nerve cells communicate information by spiking in electrical activity. A cell can be in an active spiked state or an inactive dormant state. 
These active and inactive states correspond to the up and down states of a dipole. Using this Ising-like analysis, researchers can look at large-scale statistical behaviours of neurons and see how they correlate with each other. A final and perhaps most surprising example the Ising model works for is opinion formation on social networks. Dipoles can represent individuals who make up the network, and the up and down states can be identified with two different answers to a given question. All of this raises an important question. Why? Why can a single model with just two binary options and some simple rules apply to so many different phenomena? A dipole is very different from a gene, and a neuron is very different from an individual person. Yet it appears that the differences between these micro-level components are unimportant for some reason. How can that be? Well, here's where the magic of phase transitions really shines. Here's a simulation of the icing model at three different temperatures. I found these amazing simulations on the YouTube channel Douglas Ashton. Watch as we zoom out when we're below the critical temperature. We can see a pretty big difference between zoomed in and zoomed out. We end up with a uniform slab of dipoles. Exactly what we'd expect at low temperatures. If we zoom out when we're above the critical temperature, again, we see a pretty clear distinction between zoomed in and zoomed out. We can see a good mix of dipoles. Again, exactly what we'd expect at high temperatures. But if we zoom out on the case right at the critical temperature, well, what do we see? It looks pretty much the same. We can't really tell whether we're zoomed in or zoomed out. The lattice looks the same at any distance. This means that the microscopic details of the dipole interactions don't matter. Correlations exist over all distances, meaning that no one distance is special or preferred. This is called scale invariance, and it's a pretty magical phenomenon. It's the reason we can neglect the microscopic interactions and why such different systems act so similarly, even though their individual components are radically different. And here's where things get even weirder. For magnets, physicists have found that around the critical temperature, magnetization as a function of temperature obeys this relationship. These kinds of relationships are called power laws, and the power beta is called a critical exponent. Physically, the critical exponent represents how abrupt the transition is. If beta were smaller, the magnetization would drop off more abruptly as you approach the critical temperature. And if beta were larger, the magnetization would drop off less quickly. Essentially, the power law tells you that a phase transition happens in the first place, and the critical exponent tells you how abruptly the transition happens. Using numerical simulations, we've found that the critical exponent beta for a magnet is 0.326 in three dimensions. Now what's crazy is that many other completely different systems all share the same critical exponents. Take the liquid to gas transition. If we look at how the densities of the liquid and gas change as the temperature changes, we find that their difference obeys this power law. Experiments show that for a wide range of liquids, the critical exponent is 0.326, the same as the magnetization for magnets. This means that near the critical temperature, fluctuations in water and vapor densities behave identically to the way magnetic dipoles fluctuate in a magnet, even though dipoles and water molecules might actually interact in vastly different ways at the microscopic scale, at the macroscopic level, their phase transition behaviors are identical. This phenomenon is called universality. Universality is the idea that different physical systems behave similarly near their phase transitions, even though their microscopic building blocks are different. Physicists categorize different models having the same critical exponents into classes, called universality classes. Because the Ising model and the liquid to gas system have the same critical exponent, they both belong to the same universality class. Another universality class is the directed percolation class. Take drip coffee. You pour hot water over the coffee grounds to extract the flavor from them. If you pack the grounds too loosely, your coffee won't have much flavor. If you pack them too tightly, no water will get through. 
there's a sweet spot in the ground's density where you'll get the most flavor out of the coffee grounds. Here there's a phase where water can flow and a phase where it can't flow. This phenomenon is called directed percolation and it's modeled with a power law. The critical exponent that describes where the water starts flowing is 0.276. One phenomenon that belongs to the directed percolation class is the transition of fluids from laminar to turbulent flow. A fluid can flow in two ways, smooth, called laminar, and chaotic, called turbulent. A fluid transitions between these two states depending on its flow speed. Researchers have shown that for a certain geometry, the fraction of the flow that is turbulent obeys a power law with a critical exponent of 0.28, a value within experimental error of the critical exponent for drip coffee. So why should we care about any of this? Universality classes, Ising models, drip coffee? Because it shows us that nature is remarkably consistent. Whether we're looking at a magnet, a liquid to gas transition, or even biological systems, the critical point, the tipping point where the system changes phase, follows the same mathematical laws. The beauty of physics and math is that when you really look, there are hidden patterns everywhere. As we've seen, the same pattern can often be applied to many different things. It's just a matter of knowing how to look. Have you ever wondered how to spot these patterns in the world yourself? You don't need to be a professional scientist. All you need to know is how to effectively interpret data. Brilliant's course, Exploring Data Visually, will teach you how to do just that. With Exploring Data Visually, you'll get hands-on experience working with real-world datasets from companies like Airbnb, Spotify, Starbucks, and more. You'll learn to make sense of massive datasets and spot the kinds of patterns that help you understand market trends, social behaviors, and even scientific phenomena. Whether you're looking to boost your career prospects, get better at decision making, or just see the world differently, this course will give you the tools you need to unlock insights hidden in the data all around us. What makes Brilliant different is their philosophy of learning by doing. They have thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. I've been using Brilliant for years now to help me understand topics for my videos. What I love about Brilliant is how the active problem solving helps you form your own intuition about difficult concepts, rather than just memorizing. Their first principles approach helps you build your understanding from the ground up making even the most complex ideas accessible and engaging. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you're also becoming a better thinker. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org atom or scan the QR code on screen. Or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode.